heard about this, but you know, some time ago I heard, well, the corridor is one of 10 places being designated as an automated vehicle, autonomous vehicle proving ground. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. But what does that mean? I don't even know anything about that. And I thought, you know, before you know it, we could be driving down the road with a truck next to us and there's no driver in it. And maybe we should get somebody who knows all about this stuff to come tell us what does this mean? What's it gonna, how it will impact us and, and where we go from being designated to the future that'll be here before we know it. So I was told the expert is Daniel McGee, who is with who's director of the advanced, excuse me, make sure I don't screw this up, UI advanced driving simulator and also one of the people coordinating the efforts in the corridor around autonomous vehicles. Uh, he is a professor of engineering medicine and public health at the University of Iowa and has been involved in the field of uh, research in, in the areas of uh, vehicle safety for over 25 years. Uh, the part that I liked the most was on their website. It says, Daniel has been obsessed with car crashes for over 20 years. And I thought, well, I've got to definitely get this <laughs> So anyway, uh, please join me in welcoming Daniel McGee. Thank you all uh, for coming out today. It looks like a great uh, uh, crowd here. I'm really excited to be able to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is car crashes. Not accidents, crashes, because crashes have causes. And those of you that are in transportation and health, this is really an important nuance uh, in terms of safety culture. So I'm gonna talk about some technologies today that we're really fortunate to be able to be among the very first to be testing uh, in the country as well as internationally uh, here in Iowa. So I'm going to talk more generally just sort of about the future of automated driving, sort of where we've been and where we're going and what that means to you all uh, out there because the University of Iowa is one of the key players uh, in this area here. We're trying to maybe adjust the light, so please. Yeah, we can go a little darker here. Uh, what I have here is a couple of pictures of some of our research vehicles uh, and also the first uh, Iowa official license plate, vanity plate ever issued, uh, ought to mate. And those of you that uh, maybe remember your high school chemistry, who knows what uh, AU is? Gold. Okay, so we have a black and... Ah. Only those of you that are from Iowa will understand that. So uh, uh, this is one of our... Uh, 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 research vehicles that uh, I hope that uh, some of you will be able to come down and uh, experience tonight at 9 o'clock on KGAN. They're doing a story uh, on this vehicle and some of our research. Uh, so tune in to that. Uh, with, uh, we got a chance to hang out with Scott Mathis for a couple of days uh, to do that filming. Uh, but one of the things that's really the main headline that I want to take away, what you all to take away today is that automation and these technologies are about reducing driver error. 94% uh, most broadly, 95% of crashes have some element of driver error or some willful component like speeding, excessive speed and those kinds of things. That's a, an amazing statistic uh, that's really uh, difficult to deal with. So last year we killed 40,000 people on US roads alone. Uh, over a million people worldwide died in roadway-related uh, crashes, pedestrians, bicycles. Uh, in Iowa, 404 people lost their lives, a 27% increase from the year before. So this is a major public health issue uh, that we don't really think about. And that's why the differentiation between the word accident and crash is an important one. And as I tell my uh, uh, colleagues in the media, if you ever use the word accident uh, on the air in your print, I won't talk to you again because we need the public to know that every crash out there has a cause and we need to describe what that is so that doesn't happen to them, whether they're texting, they're impaired, they're not wearing a seat belt in the back seat, which is one of my pet peeves. Uh, we need to know what happened to, to, uh, that relates to that injury uh, or fatality. So I have the great fortune of leading this a uh, great set of laboratories at the University of Iowa. This is an $80 million driving simulator, the largest in the world. Uh, it's been operational for about 15 years. And so we get to test all of the advanced technologies in your car and come to the University of Iowa at some point 
in the last 25 years. We kind of work in about a 20 year forward time horizon. So the technologies that I'll be talking about today that are today just now coming in production into regular cars made their way through the University of Iowa about 20 years ago. Uh, so that's an exciting thing. So if you ever get a chance to come down and tour our labs, this is really a very interesting place that we're doing everything from studying the effects of cannabis and driving, a really big policy issue right now, not only in Iowa, but across the country. Of course, alcohol, many different kinds of medications, and all those different kinds of technologies uh, that are out there. So in addition to that, we have a full suite of research vehicles. Uh, uh, tomorrow, we're gonna be demonstrating for one of the local uh, transportation agencies an inflatable car that we can drive uh, vehicles that have crash avoidance technologies into, and we're gonna be pretty safe. Uh, so that's a lot of fun uh, to do that. Uh, so there's a couple terms that I wanna go over today. Advanced driver assistance systems are the technologies that are here today uh, and now are entering into inexpensive vehicles like the Chevy Cruze, the Ford Focus, the Honda Civic, the Toyota Corolla. These technologies you'll hear about, automatic emergency braking, lane keeping, all of those things are super important and the main thing is they are here now. We can talk a lot about automated, autonomous, self-driving. That's way down the road, folks. Uh, this tends to get oversold by computer companies, uh, by media, by other people. But the, the reality is the kinds of things that are gonna save your life today is advanced driver <coughs> assistance systems. And I'm gonna kinda go through uh, some of those. So we have lots of different sensors today. And again, this is today in production. So I'm just gonna pick a car. Uh, I can talk about every single manufacturer, but let's just pick one Subaru. They have a system called EyeSight. It looks way down the road, like 200 yards down the road. Uh, it's using for something called adaptive cruise control, which is an extension of your cruise control where it actually locks onto the car ahead and will slow you down if you come across a slower moving truck. Uh, and even in traffic, uh, in a 25 mile an hour zone, some vehicles like the Subaru will lock onto the car head and it will go all the way to a complete stop. From the rear, there are, uh, the Subaru has automatic braking, so you cannot back into a pole or a post or another car anymore. It doesn't allow you. You can floor it and it just won't go. Very important. Blind spot detection uh, is important. Those of you who drive on 380, 80, uh, those people that hang, hang out in that blind spot this kind of puts on a light uh, and lets you know that somebody's there. Shorter, uh, we have, shorter out, we have pedestrian detection, which is really critical. Some countries like Sweden require vehicles that have to have pedestrian detection systems for five years now. So this technology has been around for a while because in Europe, pedestrians get hit a lot more than they do here because there are many more urban areas and so forth out there. So when we talk about more highly automated vehicles, we're really kind of connecting the dots. And one of my favorite stories in this, when you take a look at the history of technology, uh, there are a lot of early adopters. How many out there consider yourself like an early adopter? You get the next iPhone, you buy like cool stuff. Yeah, quite a few people out there. Uh, but the early adopter car back in the future, back in 1958 was the Chrysler Imperial. Uh, this had the very first electronic cruise control of any car that just about everybody out there has electronic cruise control. And this is a form of automation. This is the first automation that went into production in 1958. So you say, automation? How does that work? Well, guess what? That you, when you lock your speed at, say, 70 miles an hour on your Interstate 380, it automates the function of you pressing on the gas. It will coast. Uh, it's not gonna put on the brakes, but it's gonna maintain a speed. It's automating your speed control. This car was super high tech. It even had the hi-fi. <laughs> uh, and this was a uh, record player uh, uh, in what our daughter way back when used to call the glove department. Uh, and uh, so this is the kind of thing that they were looking for people to buy this high tech stuff. So in 2017, fast forward, uh, the Tesla has also something called autopilot, which is uh, on the highway, uh, full 
uh, automation. So when we get on Interstate 380, I can press a button and the car takes control of steering, braking, everything else. If I want to change lanes, I don't touch the steering wheel, I just touch the turn signal stock and it changes lanes for you. Uh, so this is in production today. You can buy this car. Uh, we build all sorts of other fancy sensors and technologies and computers on top of the one that we have. Uh, it has a 17 inch display right here. There are no knobs in this car. It's all touch screen. Uh, so very different kind of driving. Uh, adaptive cruise control came out in about 1998 in really high-end cars like BMWs, Audis, Mercedes, uh, and so forth. And that's the technology that you can buy now for about 20,000 bucks in a Civic, Corolla, uh, and other cars. Uh, and that locks you onto the car head, puts on the brakes. Really cool technology. Next car you get, you gotta have that. Stop and go ACC brings that down. Uh, it will break all the way to a stop very smoothly. In fact, if I put a blindfold on you, um, put you in a Volvo, a Subaru, uh, a Chevy Impala, you pick the car company that has full range or stop and go ACC, you won't know that I'm not braking, that a computer is controlling all of that. It's really good, uh, very good stuff. Uh, here's a Subaru, I'm gonna go through a couple of companies, uh, Subaru EyeSight and Volvo, they work very similar. All the companies uh, have some kind of computer vision system. The Subaru has stereoscopic vision, it has essentially two eyeballs, just like, why, why, like we have, generally. Uh, they call it eyesight. What it does is it, can, can, it sort of puts together uh, and sees everything that's uh, out there and draws a box around it. So it just measures the change in the size of a box as you're getting close to it. So a pedestrian gets a vertical rectangle, a car ahead of you gets a square, a motorcycle gets a vertical rectangle. So it can track dozens and dozens of different targets, I kind of hesitate to call pedestrians targets, <laughs> but uh, this is really important uh, uh, technology. So these cars can break at the very last moment if a person walks out in front of you, say 30 feet ahead, it will automatically put on the brakes. Uh, Volvo has a system called City Safety that's been required by the Swedish government for several years now. It uses cameras and lasers and radar to do the same thing. You can't really see very well, but it's drawing boxes around uh, everything here too. We also uh, have what's called cross traffic alert. So one common uh, crash scenario that we see, especially in older drivers, is they tend to turn in front of cars at left-hand turns, especially they get hit by younger drivers. And the reason why older drivers get hit by younger drivers in this exact scenario is that younger drivers are generally driving faster than uh, the rest of the traffic. So we have a certain expectation of how fast cars are coming to us, towards us in that kind of scenario. Uh, we have a difficult time in general perceiving speed and older drivers even more so. So uh, a number of, of vehicles like the Volvo actually won't let you turn left if it's detecting a car that's approaching you. It puts on the brakes uh, before you turn in front of them. So consumer acceptance is really key to this area. So write this website down, mycardoeswhat.org. Uh, this is a project I've been leading with our partners at the National Safety Council. This is now the largest public service uh, campaign around vehicle safety uh, technologies in history. We just passed 6.4 billion, with a B, media impressions uh, on this project. Uh, it's really exciting. We have some 40 different safety technologies on cars and so we went out, and what do you do? You get a guy and his dog uh, to talk about all these interesting technologies, and that kind of saves the world. Uh, if you can have a guy and his dog talk about these fancy technologies, uh, then people are gonna start to understand it. And this is a big gap, is that right now, if you take a look at the last 20 years of the kinds of safety technologies that have come onto our cars, analog brakes came out in 1996. Most of you have analog brake systems, but it was almost 15 years till the next technology came on, electronic stability control, which stabilizes your car so you don't spin out uh, like in snow and, and uh, so forth. But this year there are some 20 technologies that are just completely reigning into uh, cars today. And it's very important that we understand how they work so we can use them uh, best to our advantage. So the main headline, like I said, is technology is here today. Here's the Chevy Cruze, here's the 
Honda Civic. Again, I can talk about every single manufacturer has these technologies, so I'm not uh, marketing any uh, particular one. These are just used for uh, examples. Now, the other important element that we're working for, in fact, Iowa is yet again uh, the first in the country, the first in the world to do this, is we are uh, defining uh, some 1,300 miles of roadways in the Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty corridor in the metro area on our rural highways around here, freeways. Right now, your GPS system on your phone is good to about plus or minus one meter, so about six feet. So we can't really use that to drive it as a map. We can't control uh, a vehicle based on that because it would put you into the other lane. So high definition mapping gets that one meter, plus or minus one meter, down to plus or minus five centimeters. So that we can use to augment all of these really cool sensors that we have on vehicles as a redundant piece of information. So the future of automated driving requires that we have many different systems checking each other because safety is absolutely key. One crash, one fatality will uh, slow down and, and uh, interrupt all of the really great advances that we're making uh, in this space. So high definition mapping, the Iowa DOT uh, is the first to invest in this along with uh, Iowa economic development. And what we're hoping uh, is, and we're already seeing this, our, the first day that we announced uh, this project and then we were uh, designated by the US DOT as a proving ground, I had a major automaker come the same day that this was announced and say, uh, we're gonna give you a couple million dollars to do our testing. So that was the very first day. From there, we have a number of other uh, manufacturers and suppliers that are coming here. So it's a great investment to come to Iowa uh, to do this kind of research. Because the next generation of automotive uh, technology is not going to be controlled by 12 car makers. It's going to be, uh, there are thousands of small companies that have eight or 10 engineers, computer scientists, and other people putting this together. So it's really not about attracting a huge company to come here. It's about putting together a business climate to attract lots of little small companies to come here and use this kind of data. So what we're doing uh, as, as one of the lead partners for the Iowa DOT is that we're putting together a research climate so that people come and do testing for free. We let them get onto this HD map for free. That's really attractive because it doesn't exist anywhere outside of Google's own proprietary mapping, uh, Microsoft and most car companies have their own proprietary maps, but they don't let anybody else drive those maps. So uh, once you develop a product with your one of those companies, then the state uh, will uh, license uh, the product. So they'll take a small uh, piece of that just to try to regenerate kind of the funding from that. So this is a really exciting opportunity. And I think one of the things that we have to be really proud about uh, in Iowa is that we can put together this kind of thing that our uh, leaders have the vision to be able to put this kind of thing together because most state DOTs don't have that kind of vision so it's really exciting. So this is uh, kind of a blurry shot of where we're going to be mapping all around here, Cedar Rapids, the corridor, uh, parts of Interstate uh, 80, uh, but all the metropolitan area. So again this is a really big uh, first out there. So this is a collaboration between the Iowa DOT, the National Advanced Driving Simulator, and this uh, kind of hard to read, Iowa City Area Development. As uh, we put uh, this uh, proposal together to the US DOT, 64 cities and universities put together proposals. They only awarded 10. Uh, and that's uh, really gratifying because we've been in this space for a long time. So that was very intense uh, competition out there. Uh, so these are the different sites around the country from Florida, a couple in California, one in Texas. We're here in the Midwest. Our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison are there. Our colleagues at the University of Michigan, uh, some other areas outside of New York City. And I'm going to read this quote from our uh, former Secretary of Transportation, uh, Anthony Fox, who said about this program, the designated proving grounds will collectively form a community of practice around the testing and deployment of these automated vehicles. The group will openly share best practices for safe con conduct and testing and operations of their development. And this is really key, is that the federal government, 
uh, is very interested in us working together to put together different practices and share those things so that we uh, f can form a consensus on the best way uh, to test automated vehicles uh, on the road. So very important to, to get that out there. So in terms of moving forward right now, we're uh, in the next six months that we're putting together uh, all sorts of local leaders here. I've talked to the city, Rap city Cedar Rapids uh, uh, city councilors in infrastructure committee. We've talked to the cities of Iowa City, Coroval, North Liberty, uh, county supervisors. Uh, I get to go uh, brief our different transportation committees in Des Moines and the House and the Senate, uh, work with them on really keeping them up to speed about how all this is coming together. We're in the process of putting together a, a demonstration of how we can uh, show drivers real-time information when let's just say there's a, a crash uh, on the road or a disabled vehicle on the road. How do we verify all that information, get it into the DOT system and then display it to the driver in a, in a safe way? We're doing that in about six months. Uh, about a year from now, 14 months from now, we're actually gonna do a, a very highly automated uh, drive on 380 where we're building a vehicle right now that can use this high definition mapping, all of the sensors that we have to actually drive completely by itself using this high definition mapping and other uh, information. Again, one of the first places to be able to do that in a public way. Uh, and then finally, the really important aspect that we want to take advantage of in Iowa is that we want to integrate our agriculture uh, uh, friends into this uh, space. So right now, John Deere, other ag companies can do completely automated harvesting with their combines. But once they get to the edge of the field, that's where it stops. So we're working with John Deere and others to actually do a uh, demonstration of taking it from farm to distribution center. And one area that we've been talking to is our friends at the Eastern Iowa Airport that have a number of farm plots around them. We have the ADM plant. This might be a really great local demonstration to show how we can do automated uh, uh, moving of goods from uh, the field to those distribution centers. So that's an exciting, unique aspect that we can put onto this kind of work uh, here in Iowa. Some of you want to say, gosh, now what would it be like to drive through uh, an automated uh, intersection where there are essentially no traffic lights. Because in the future, we're not going to have signs, we're not going to have traffic lights. Again, this is the long range future. I don't want you to think this is coming anytime soon. 50 years from now, let's call it 50 years uh, from now. Uh, we put together in the simulator uh, what it might look like to drive through uh, one of those uh, uh, intersections. So let's uh, see if I can make this work. Well, maybe not. Well, it looks like I have a little burp here in the system, so uh, we'll move on here. What I will show you is uh, we have a uh, business partnership memorandum of understanding with the Swedish government, Volvo, and Chalmers University. And Sweden is probably the most far-looking uh, country in the world in terms of how they are planning for full implementation in urban areas of automated vehicles. And I want to kind of show you a quick three minute video of what they're just now sharing with the Swedish population about the government's vision about urban uh, areas. And we'll bring that up here. And like all the other cities and it constantly changes we become more people city grows we build houses more roads and parking lots more vehicles but human beings also need space so what would happen if we drive away the cars of today start using autonomous cars instead. Autonomous cars don't need any signs. And autonomous cars need less space, enabling wider sidewalks. It creates more space for us humans. And autonomous cars can drive and park at parts of the world. Look at this commute station. 
So there you have uh, sort of the utopian vision of uh, Sweden, which is a little different than uh, how we think about things, but it's nonetheless very interesting to see what's possible. Um, so finally, I'll wrap up here to say that ADAS systems, advanced driver system systems, are here today. If you're in the market for a new car, uh, ask for these kinds of things. Very important. They will save you, guarantee you, uh, that you will find that they trigger more than you might think. Uh, don't worry about fully automated robots driving down Interstate uh, 380 or 80 uh, anytime soon. It's way off. Uh, the kinds of things that you will see in different uh, corporate press releases and videos and even the media are highly scripted uh, events. Certainly we can drive automated vehicles, but there's a big difference between testing and implementation. So think about what's possible today that can affect you and your family for the good. Uh, follow this stuff. It's really, really cool. It's, it's phenomenal. I've been uh, doing the technology development side of this for about 25 years and so it's what's really fun is to go down and drive a car that costs twenty thousand dollars that has technologies that we were testing here uh, way back when uh, to see how it's implemented remember the driver error is really uh, the key uh, out there and this is what we're trying to reduce uh, and finally crashes are no accident so uh, remove that word from your vocabulary, even in the industrial setting, you know, when uh, big companies say we've had 33 accident-free days or we had an accident, quote unquote, it's really important to describe what happened. A person fell off the ladder and broke their leg. Say what it was so that you can prevent it uh, in the future. So that's really a, a key uh, area there. Uh, and finally, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, you can find me at uh, Dan Crashman on Twitter. Uh, so you can follow some of the work that uh, we're doing uh, or shoot, certainly send me an email uh, with any of your comments. So I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have uh, out there. We're going to try to get a microphone out. Did we get a microphone? No microphone? If, if we use that one and you stood at the... Yep, let's do that. Good idea. Um, my question would be about in that utopian scenario where they say that um, the electric or automated vehicles take less space and they can just drive off and park elsewhere, you know, outside the city core. In your field of study, are you envisioning where everyone still owns one or two or three vehicles? and they're all automated or are you envisioning that it's sort of a summon kind of a thing where you just summon a vehicle when you walk out of work and then it takes you home and then goes off to pick up somebody else so which scenario yeah really good question you? so the future of driving 50 years from now we will not own our cars anymore and even today cars are really much more appliances to us uh, uh, i don't know how many of you out there used to change your own oil and have like a pair of racks in, the, in, the, in your garage. Uh, you won't find very many 25 year olds that are gonna do that in the future. Uh, we use cars uh, quickly, we lease cars, it's the, probably the cheapest way to go. So cars really, they won't even really park, they will be moving all the time. As you said, they might go outside the city like in the middle of the night, but during the day they're moving. And so when you uh, are ready to leave your house at 7.45 in the morning or whatever time you leave, uh, your patterns, your movement patterns will be known very well by the overall system. And so you essentially will summon that vehicle so that when you're ready, uh, and even down to the point of, well, I gotta eat breakfast, I'm gonna brush my teeth, and I, I know that's gonna you know, take me 90 seconds to make it to my front door, there'll be vehicles in your neighborhood that will just come and pick you up just in time, take you to work. Uh, when you wanna leave for home, uh, you have a fairly predictable time that you leave every day so these vehicles will be roving, electric uh, automated vehicles. Again, very long range future, 50 years from now. Okay. Will you still have accessible vehicles? Uh, say what, what? Accessible, yeah, wheelchair accessible. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, that's gonna be, in terms of uh, increasing mobility for different populations, that's gonna be really critical. I think the challenge will be 
is that while we can get you an automated vehicle to come to your house, it generally takes a person to help you get into that vehicle too. And I think that's one of the key pieces we have to figure out what we're going to do for certain access uh, for accessibility uh, issues. Yes. I was just wondering with some of this technology can it inadvertently um, actually go against being that driver. So I have this in my car, I get in an accident or crash. I, I say I'm going 25 miles an hour, but the details in the car, the technology tell me I was going 65. And you know, good defense will turn to these prosecutors. I actually use some of this information that maybe you don't even realize the car is collecting on you or your driving habits and kind of use it against you. Do you start, do you see that happening uh, now and in the future? Yeah, so uh, right now you own the data in your car. So there's, uh, uh, most cars that have been built for the last 10 years have a, an, uh, it's called an event data recorder. It's hooked to your airbag module. So if you have a crash where your airbag goes off, uh, it will tell us uh, in the last five seconds leading up to the airbag deployment, what your speed was, whether your seatbelt was on, whether you were braking, uh, accelerating, uh, and a few other things. Some of, you know, some uh, car makers have more information you own those data unless somebody dies in that crash. Or there's a lawsuit, uh, uh, those data can be subpoenaed. In the automated vehicle future, again, the 50 year long range future, there's an enormous amount of data uh, that these vehicles collect. And, and even Google has, uh, uh, in their uh, automated vehicle trials uh, in Northern California, whenever there is a crash and they generally get hit from behind because they're in traffic all day long, stop and go traffic, a rear end collision is the most common uh, crash type. Slow speed that you get hit by five miles an hour. They actually publish all of their uh, data online. It's open to the public. You can go on and, and look at every single time Google's been involved in a crash and I think 99% of them are, they're not at fault. They publish that information, in fact, states will require that automated vehicles publish their information. But it's not you, your driving, it's the vehicle's performance. And so you're gonna be out of that loop, so you won't have any responsibility uh, in that crash. If you take a look at a couple of generations ago, uh, elevators, there was, if you read about when elevators went automated, right? For, for a long time, elevators all had operators. People sat in there and they manually controlled uh, 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 an elevator, and there's a really big public outcry. Well, this, there's no way that this is safe, uh, and for the same reason that somebody has to be responsible. So obviously, driving is much more complicated. But in terms of assigning uh, liability, those things are coming together right now. You have mentioned the bubbles. What is happening with like your sports um, um, riding of uh, motorcycles, crash rockets? Well, I think that uh, when you buy a motorcycle, you want to drive it. Uh, I haven't seen of any motor automated motorcycle trials, uh, but I think what you're getting at is that there will be other manually operated vehicles in the uh, environment uh, in the future. What we will be doing uh, in the long-term future is every vehicle essentially will be squawking information about itself. So how fast it's going, whether you're braking, your exact location, whether you're coming around a corner, uh, all of those things, cars will be, and vehicles will be talking to one another continuously so we understand what everybody else is doing. So in the case of uh, when you have like a construction zone, you know, when I came up here around uh, just south of the city, the, the, the lanes kind of narrow, traffic can all of a sudden slow down really quickly. Well, our systems will already know that the traffic is slowing down quickly to avoid uh, some of those traffic conflicts and, and, and rear end collisions. So every car will be talking to one another, traffic lights will be talking to cars. So there'll be a lot more communication out there. Yes? Will communicating vehicles be able to identify non-communicating vehicles like, like motorcycles? Yeah, so the, uh, the sensors that are available today detect motorcycles. Uh, so like I said before, it's all about redundancy. We wanna get as many redundant signals as possible into the vehicle. And we always make the assumption that it's not talking. Well, and even if that motorcycle has a driver, won't it still probably have technology that will be communicating with another vehicle? Exactly. And they, you know, there may be limiters on that too. If you're entering into a bunch of traffic it's not going to let you drive 100 miles an hour. 
Um, I've noticed that Americans are very private and possessive of their own things, and they also like to drive. So how do you envision overcoming this obstacle and changing minds so that use becomes widespread enough that these shared vehicles become economically feasible? So you're talking about privacy information, or uh, can you be more specific? Um, so people just like to have their car. And right. You can Yes. So this is really going to be a generational shift. Uh, if you take a look at uh, especially urban areas today and the proliferation of Uber and Lyft, so ride sharing, uh, my daughter lives in Washington, D.C., uh, where she has access to a fabulous uh, underground metro system. But if you look at what she spends in a month on Uber, about $200, and a metro, about $80 a month, it's way cheaper than owning a car. And you sort of adapt the way you... Uh, look at transportation. I think today, and in our area, we don't have uh, rail and other things, but Uber is actually pretty convenient. If you fly into the airport into Cedar Rapids, uh, from the time you touch down, you can order an Uber that will meet you curbside. So it's very analogous to what, we're, what Sweden is trying to uh, plan because Uber drivers hang out in downtown Iowa City, which is about 17 minutes out to the airport. So that's about how long it takes to uh, uh, from the time you're taxiing in to the time you walk out on the curves, about 17 minutes if everything goes okay. So those kinds of things are happening now for a lot of people, but it's not something that just one day we say, okay, you can't have your car anymore. This is over a very long period of time. So young drivers today that are 16, uh, in their lifetime, it's going to transition away from that. And they're going to like that because, as I said, cars are really appliances now. They're not the personal... Uh, part of your personal identity and brand. Uh, people drive lots of different branded vehicles. You, you know, a generation ago, you used to buy a Chevy was your family, and that's what you had uh, sometimes for generations. Uh, we don't do that, and uh, so it's again, it's going to be an evolving process. Are you looking at the security of this? My understanding is even with the level of autonomy that there is now, that there have been people who have hacked into those systems and then been able to control that vehicle, uh, you know, remotely, being compared to the person sitting in the car. So are you addressing that, and how are you addressing those security issues? Yeah, security, obviously, in every single field is of, of paramount importance, uh, and especially in the automotive context, because you can imagine if somebody were to hack into uh, a Chevy uh, Impala, for instance, and say, at 5 o'clock today, I'm going to turn uh, 100,000 Chevy Impala steering wheels uh, 20 degrees to the right for five seconds. Uh, that would be catastrophic, uh, uh, and no car company, no supplier wants that to happen to them. So every company is investing mightily into computer security. In fact, there are very few cars that allow over-the-air uh, updates and over-the-air access. Tesla is one of them, but they have practically military-level security uh, which is really necessary to be able to do that. We're going to see more car makers go that way, but it's going to be a very slow process because of that. There was one uh, occasion about five years ago uh, where a couple of computer scientists uh, took a Jeep and they put it in their garage for a whole year and they completely uh, disassembled the computer code, called a journalist and said, we're going to go for a ride and then drove them off the road in a safe way, but just drove them into a, a grass field. Uh, to demonstrate that they could take over uh, the vehicle control remotely. But it's, it's one of the top areas uh, in the auto industry right now, really critical. Uh, given the automated ride share sort of future you talked about, how do you see that impacting conventional uh, transit, specifically bus travel, uh, in the future and now? I think conventional transit's going to be still vital. I mean, I think what you saw and the Swedish example is the way I see it sort of playing out. It's really about sort of the last, the so-called last mile, right? So we'll still commute on our buses, but it's about getting from the bus to your home. Uh, and then uh, outside of your, your, your uh, commuting uh, activity, how we go about using ride sharing. But no, I, th I think that uh, transit is, is a key part uh, of the future. How do you see the role of car seats, newborns, babies, toddlers, that whole, do you think that the car seats will go away because they don't need that impact safety, or do you see certain vehicles like the accessible vehicles having those available? What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think uh, as a guy who studies crashes for a living, uh, that we're always going to need those really good car seats uh, uh, out there. I think that's still crash testing is going to be an important part because these cra these cars will still crash. There's no doubt. Uh, we hope that they're not going to crash at the same speeds that we do now. Uh, most fatal crashes in North America occur on rural highways, Highway 1, Highway 6, where you drop a wheel, you overcorrect, you go into the ditch, you hit a tree, you hit a culvert, those kinds of scenarios. That's how we die in, in North America. Uh, and so those kinds of scenarios will be uh, eliminated or reduced drastically under uh, a different kind of control system. Yes. I have two concerns. Well, I have many concerns, but, but two major ones based on what you're saying. Um, one is that period of time where the oh, thank you. The period of time where we're going to have partial automation, um, like we saw with the Tesla crash, where you have a driver who gets complacent, doesn't really pay attention anymore. That's sort of the nature of a human being. It's why Google decided not to do partial autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and the other concern is I'm not seeing that much in terms of accessibility considerations on the part of the car companies. I see that on the, the tra those little um, AV transit shuttle manufacturers, they are making accessible vehicles, but I'm not seeing any attention from the car companies on that, even though they're spending billions investing in technology. Yeah, so your first question that has to do with sort of the level of automation. So you have sort of the most extreme automation, which is a complete robot, you know, driving your car. There's no steering wheel, there's no brake, there's no way to take over them. I mean, you can hit like an emergency stop or something like that, perhaps. Versus the kind of uh, mid-level automation, for lack of a better word. I mean, there are ways to define automation, but uh, uh, where the driver is still very much in control. Uh, today. Uh, advanced driver assistance systems are really not automation per se. Tesla is, uh, has some automation that's changed since that crash. In fact, last week uh, we had the chief crash investigator of the National Transportation Safety Board at the University of Iowa that gave the first public briefing on that Tesla crash. And we had, uh, uh, we were able to contribute to that investigation because we do some of that work. Uh, but systems out there right now the way they monitor the driver, like Tesla, it requires you to hold the wheel about every 90 seconds or put some sort of steering input to let the system know that you're still actively engaged, quote unquote. Uh, Cadillac uh, has a new system called Super Cruise that's coming out where it has a little uh, computer vision system that's behind the steering wheel that actually looks at your eyes. And if you look away from the road for more than even three or four seconds, it gets kind of grumpy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it's something that we think is really important issue. It's, you raise a very, very critical issue because we are not good at monitoring things. So whether you're an airplane pilot, work in a nuclear power control room, or you're driving a train, we are not good at just studying and watching a computer drive. We have to have some sort of activity. And that's why Google uh, has made uh, the decision to sort of remove the driver altogether so there is no interaction, period. But again, that's to make that work in traffic. I mean, some of the uh, uh, sort of narrow gauge microbus transit uh, areas are in very controlled access areas. Uh, and in terms of access and mobility, uh, I think that will come because if you look at the vehicles that are being d developed right now, so let's say the Chrysler Pacifica is being used by Google right now for a fully automated tribal trial. The Chrysler Pacific is, can be retrofitted for accessibility. So it's really taking a vehicle like a van, a minivan, and retrofitting it just like we do today, except it's going to have a different kind of control structure on the front, you know, in the driver area. So I think that's going to come. My, I think the bigger issue is how do, we, how do we get to the curb, to the car, and then out of the car again. Uh, that's, that's the area that I think is sort of the gap. Because we can get the car to your doorstep and to your driveway, but how do we get you into the car by yourself? Uh, and then once you get to the store, how do we get you into the store to do your thing? So it's like we, we're really good at that middle part, but it's the ends that are my concern. I'm, I just have a comment. Um, as a mom with very active children, um, I'm concerned about the fact that the leisure seats, coolers, tents for shade, and keep 
it's already a man, any man, while they're doing their deal and have a break, and it's not like they're two, three hours away from home, football games, rain gear, blankets. I just, that Swedish model that's cool, and it'll be on um, my lifetime, but I just don't know how realistic that would be with the active kids we have today. What would you do with everything you store in your minivan? Yeah, I mean, and, and, I, and I've, I've lived that world, uh, uh, and I and I agree that uh, I think when we had a minivan, it was just like a mobile uh, uh, storage unit. Uh, but I think things are gonna that are gonna slowly change in terms of what our expectation today is is to be able to schlep around all that stuff. Fifty years from now, uh, when you're a great grandmother. Uh, you're going to be really happy to be able to have that car pick you up and get taken uh, to Des Moines to, for that uh, soccer game at, uh, out there. So, uh, again, this is not going to happen overnight uh, for inconvenience. I think uh, the way our, our, our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids are going to think about transportation is going to be very different about how it is today. I see it already in my daughter who's like, I'm never going to own a car. I, why would I do that? Because i got to park it. i got to pay for parking. i got to go get it. i got to park in this parking garage on the sixth floor and all the cars are all backed up. It takes me half an hour to get out. It's like, I'm just going to get picked up at the curb on Uber and go, you know, it's expensive, but you know, cars are expensive, maintenance, gas, parking, buying it, the capital expense. If you look at what we actually pay every month for a car. It's really expensive. Even a used car, it's expensive. I wonder if you can speak to the variability of road conditions with the weather, just anticipating when you're coming in. Great question. Oh my gosh. Awful. Yeah, ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> We're stuck in our houses. We're going to be homebound commuters uh, during the winter. Uh, today, yeah, that's a huge problem. Uh, tomorrow, as we get better mapping, uh, it's going to help, but it's going to be a big issue. But the really good thing is that when I talked about vehicle to vehicle communication is that our wheels, uh, as they contact the road, our tires, as they contact the road are really sophisticated sensors today. So you, uh, some of you, if you bought a car in the last five years or so, eight years, uh, even 10 years have a technology called electronic stability control. And that is where, uh, the wheels are constantly testing. Uh, how they're slipping on the road. We can take that same information and say, let's say you hit a piece of uh, black ice or a slippery spot uh, on the highway. Well, that car, your car, is going to talk to the next car behind you and say, hey, I just slipped here at this exact location with plus or minus five centimeters. Uh, slow down and get ready to hit that kind of patch. And then as every car goes over that and it gets warmer and it, it doesn't slip as much, that information gets communicated back and forth. So think about this as just an amazing communication network to say, hey, I'm here, I'm slipping, it tells the next person behind you, okay, I'm getting ready to go over that little patch that lasts for like three or four seconds. This is going to be our last question for this segment. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Uh, well, the first part is, say 50 years from now, when these things become more and more prevalent, uh, if I'm going to take my family on a nice cross-country road trip to Wally World, like Clark Griswold, am I going to be able to do that? And then the second part is, do you think that the new uh, Federal Highway Administrator, uh, Paul Trombino, being from Iowa, will be able to uh, help in a special way our efforts here in the corridor? Yeah, so the first question uh, uh, about your, your uh, road trip across the country is absolutely. So if you think about uh, how we rent cars, so you can go to the Cedar Rapids airport and rent uh, a little car that's going to fit you and your suitcase, and that's about it, or you can rent a minivan. Uh, so same thing, you just have to, on your smartphone, say, I want to go from here to uh, uh, Salt Lake City or you know, to the... Wasatch Mountains, uh, and it'll say, okay, here's a route, and how many people you want to go, how much space do you want, and a car will come and pick you up uh, and take you there. So you essentially would own, you know, be in that car, like a rental car for that week, and just sort of telling it where you're going to take you. Again, long range future, so. And the second question, Paul Trambino, who's a former Iowa DOT director, has just been named as the Federal Highway Administration Administrator for the 
for the federal government. So he's responsible for all of the infrastructure uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, when we got that announcement, I texted him right away because uh, we get to, we got the great uh, pleasure to work with him. Uh, we're talking to him right now about uh, how that's going to help uh, Iowa. So we think that's a huge advantage because uh, a lot of the HD mapping work that I talked about today was his vision. And so what I'm proposing right now to the U.S. DOT, in fact, I'm going to Washington in a couple of weeks. I'm proposing an Eisenhower uh, style uh, federal freeway program that HD maps all of our major freeways in the U.S. And that's who I'm going to be talking to about that. Great. Thank you, Daniel, very much.